everyone. Good morning. First, please allow me to start by introducing myself. My name is Ali Matar, and I'm heading the LTS business for LinkedIn in South Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. Today, we're doing what we call a speaker series. We've started this um, initiative a few months back at LinkedIn, and around the world, we've been uh, interviewing some thought leaders, the like of Richard Branson, Deepak Chopra, President Obama. And for the first time, we're doing this in this region with Mr. Khalaf al Habtur. I just wanted to, to introduce our speakers as well, give you a little bit idea about what we're going to be spending the coming 45 minutes. Um, Mr. Khalaf al Habtur is the founder and the chairman of Al Habtur Group of Companies. Um, he's a self made uh, person, started his company back in the 1970s, and today it's one of the fastest growing and the biggest in the Gulf region. Different line of businesses real estate, hospitality, and others. Yesterday evening, when I was doing some a quick search, I mean, he's, he's well known and very famous, yet I wanted to, to see some, some news. Um, I was inspired and impressed, Mr. Khalaf, to see there is over 32 different awards and recognitions that um, Mr. Khalaf has recognized globally from business thought leaders, from political, and from different, uh, from different uh, perspectives in the world. Uh, not because I'm Lebanese, but I was very happy to see that in 1995, uh, Mr. Khalaf was awarded the knighthood uh, from the president of Lebanon. He's also well known to be uh, focused on peace initiatives and an unofficial ambassador of the UAE. Uh, on, the, uh, on the other line, we have Fred. Fred is the vice president of leadership and organizational development at LinkedIn. He's been with us for almost two years and six months. He's also a philosopher. He has a PhD from MIT, and he's also a well um, instructor in economics. Fred is also very well known to be a mentor. With this, I would like to start the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Halaf, um, what would you say is the essence of leadership? I'd like to start understanding your, your philosophy, your perspective about what it takes to lead and what makes a leader. I saw in a movie once, they say, you, you read and I lead. You read and I lead. But I don't take that as an example, but something sometimes you have to use to think about it, you know. I think, you know, leadership on, on, the, on the blood of the person. Leadership on the way of how your parents raised you, how your family, how they treated you, you know, when you were a little boy or little girl. There is philosophy in life. Every, everyone has his own way of life, as I said earlier to you. Maybe I'm, I'm driving on this road. It doesn't mean that everybody in the same track in the road. Everybody has an own road, everything like net. I believe on something very important, which is between a bracket what the English call it discipline in life. In our religious as a Muslim, we call it, I call it constitution of God. Constitution of God, which is you have to be very much disciplined, as the English always taught us, that discipline is the time. What time you have your breakfast, what time you sleep, what time your lunch, what time your dinner, what time you wake up, what time if you want to pray, nobody forcing you, you want to pray, you want to have a shower, how many times, etc. This is the discipline. What time to go to bed in the, in the night? Mm -hmm. If you are against that discipline, I assure you there will be no success. Maybe you will be successful in a time and then it will, it will fail. Because where business or to be recognized or to be respected, respected among people, you have, to be, you have to have the energy as well. You have to, when you go to somebody, you have to be full of energy, full of preparation and, and mobilization that you are well equipped. You have the ammunition to, to, to talk, ammunition to help, but people sometimes, you know, they come drained because they didn't sleep 
or they didn't do sports. Because, I mean, one of the reasons to make your energy is sport and to sleep. This is the basic, what I call it, and to start with. This is not everything. Yes. How did you learn about this? You, you said how important it is, the family and the, the, the way you were brought up. So in your particular case, how did you learn about the importance of discipline from your early childhood? I'm sure well, that's in uh, your blood. Well, I learned, to be honest, myself. Uh, of course, I, get, I give my father a lot of credit for that. When I was a little boy, you know, he used to take me to the desert on the camels. And we were sharing even the dates, you know, which we import from Persia, dates with our camels. And we eat because of the hunger those days, you know. And uh, I mean, we feel all of us as a part, this animal is part of us and we are part of that animal. There is no differentiation, no discrimination like the, 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 in the West, you know, that you are t uh, discriminating animal, discriminating a human being. No, we love, we love our animals and we take care of our animals. And uh, he, he trained me, my father, how to swim, how to hunt, how to ride, and how to pray. You know, to pray, which it doesn't take time from you as a Muslim or Christian or a Jews or whatever. It doesn't take time. There's a few minutes. It doesn't waste your time at all. You know, if you want, this is, this is part of disciplinary. I call it, yes. Hmm. And in the desert, I imagine it, it's, it's a very tough environment to develop the, the discipline and to keep your energy. How did that then translate into your business life? Well, before I haven't thought of business. I've thought to ride camels and uh, race and win. I'd like to understand the, the continuity from that experience in the desert and how you learn discipline and keeping your energy to the way you started working in business. What, what's, what's the continuity? How did it translate? It was in my blood, you know, when I was a little boy, we were in a Shindaga. Shindaga is the main, the heart of Dubai, it used to be, not anymore, unfortunately. And uh, I used to go with my father and my elder brother uh, together. I never like, maybe it's very bad, you know, I don't want to say that. I don't like to play with the children. When I, was. I like to go with my father. I like to go with my brother. I like to go and hear the uh, older people, you know, what they are talking about. I like to accompany them. I'm not the type of person to sit and play on the, in the street and run left and right. Even football, you know, my, I played once and my mother decided not to play because, uh, you know, said, no, I don't want you to play football. You go with your father better. Learn how to hunt, learn how to swim, learn, learn how to ride horses and camels. And this is was, I was mixing with much older people when I was in my 12 years, 10 years. I used to go with my father for six years, five years. He take me to the desert. And when did you move from that life to starting what has become this business empire it's been described? Well, I was, you know, one of my uh, father and brother, businessman friend, he's their best friend. And uh, when he saw me, you know, always I come to the majlis with him and said, he said, you know, and I hate the school, by the way. Sorry, I I'm not encouraging you. I, uh, I, I left school early myself, and uh, very early. And uh, this is why I try to compensate now to support school, to support university, research, etc. And uh, this guy, a friend of my father and uh, my brother, said, Khalaf, I would like you to, be, to work with me in Abu Dhabi. At that time, I was about 16. 16, 17. I said, yes, sir, why not? I left school and he made a salary for me. And every day I drive to Abu Dhabi, it takes me three and a half hours going, three and a half hours coming, every single day, you know. I mean, really exhausted. And uh, I learned a lot from him. He is a master. And uh, thanks to him, 
And uh, after that, after three years working with him, I decided to leave because of, let us call it, technical reason. I decided to leave, and he tried to persuade me to stay. And uh, I said, you know, I have to go. And I left. And the only thing I trained in the area of construction. I have no experience in anything else. And he, I promise him and I undertake that if I'm leaving him, I'm not going to do construction because he trained me. And I, I promise it's a promise. Those days, nothing in writing. And then I went, you will read that in my book. I went, I said, you know, to try to do some business. I don't have a penny in my pocket. I borrowed 5,000 dirham, 5,000 rupees that time, Indian rupees, from my brother. And I import a few things, tent from Sweden, I remember. And it shows in the catalog the tent is a tent. Later when it brought it, it was a tent as big as this. <laughs> you know, it doesn't take a human being, a person, you know. And I fail on that, you know. Later, with that 5,000 as well, you know, those days a lot, 5,000, I import few fridges and washing machine. I put them in place. And all my friends bought them, they didn't pay me money. <laughs> and the 5,000 gone. I stayed without a penny. <laughs> and then uh, I went to my ex boss. I said, Sir, the only thing I learned, I want to thank you everything. I'm coming here not to, to apply to work for you, but I want you to give me because it is moral responsibility and moral commitment. I need your approval to, to give me approval that I can do work on my own. He said, Hala, why don't you come and work for me? I said, sorry, I can't. He said, Hala, go and do whatever you want. I know you will not be successful. <laughs> yeah. I said, thank you, sir. Immediately, I went Anna, to a person. He had an apartment building, and I rent from him one bedroom apartment. I went, I said to him, I don't have money to pay you the rent. He said, it doesn't, doesn't matter. I went about a desk, st the steel desk two, three, and I put them there. I told them I'm not going to pay because I don't have the money. I brought two, one engineer and one administrator from that company. They are fired. They were fired from that company. I said, listen, one Egyptian and one Palestinian. I said to them, you know that I have no money and you are fired. You have no job. Come, we work together. If we make money, I will give you. They said, Khalaf, we will do everything for you. We'll work. I brought them, they were working 24 hours for me. The first time that I went, I heard his great friend of my brother called Abdul, late Abdul Rahab Galadari, great guy. He has a cinema called Plaza Cinema, it's still here in uh, Bardubai, Shindagh Bardubai, Plaza Cinema. And uh, he said, I want you to tender against your boss. I said, thank you very much. I said, yes, I will do that, but I, I cannot provide you the bonds. You need performance bond, you need the tender bonds and this. He said, don't worry, I will give you, because he is a banker as well. He said, I will give you. I said, great, thank you very much. I went there, I start working. I didn't sleep for maybe three days, work on the tender, break down everything, myself with the other engineer. This, and then I called my great friend. He worked with me, my colleague, and uh, that I, in the evening to help me in the pricing. And we price, we came, you know, neck to neck, as they said. And then Abdulhab Gildari said, no, Khalaf, I prefer you, and I don't like him. That's my competitor, I hate him. <laughs> I said, thank you, that's good news. <laughs> and uh, I got that. That's the first job I took. First, no, this is second job. First uh, job, I didn't make a penny. First, and from that time, I made good money from that, uh, from Galadari project, which is Plaza Cinema, still there, you can go and see it. Yeah, it was one of the most beautiful uh, mo uh, theater, it used to be. I made about uh, half a million dirham at that time. Half a million equal now maybe 50 million, or 500 million. Wow. Yeah. So what, what was the secret of the success? I mean, you, you have done something that many people would like to do, and um, you managed to do it in a way that many people don't manage to do it. W what is it that you attribute 
the difference? What, what, what's the difference that made the difference in your case? As I said earlier, everybody has his own method, more uh, philosophy in life, more, uh, uh, I don't know how you want to evaluate it. Uh, personally, always I said, the most difficult thing in life is the decision. The most difficult is the decision. There is always, I say, between a man and a man or woman and a woman is the decision. A person who takes decision is a leader. And we make a mistake. You know, sometimes, I mean, a decision, you cannot guarantee your decision is right, but you must take it. Like if you go to hospital, like once and I have perforated ulcer, long time. And my brother insisted he wanted to take me to London. The doctor here called Chin Chinwala in the Indian, he said, if you go to the airport, you'll be dead before the airport. I take a decision, I said, I pushed my brother, I said, you do it. And I take a decision that he should fix the, the perforation. Otherwise, I will be dead. So the decision, this is the difference between I call it a man and male, man and male. The man can take a decision, the one who doesn't take a decision is a male. <clears throat> the decision, a decision not everybody can do it. A decision the most complicated in life, to take a decision, and this is the hardest. And this is where you take the responsibility. But in addition to that, not everything is decision to take decision wrong. No, should be also well calculated, well calculated, and to see what is the percentage of risk, and what is the percentage of success. Plus, I believe in something which is very important these days. Unfortunately, you cannot find the right people. You know, when you go to war. The general, the sexual, I mean, let us take the greatest man on earth, which I, I believe in him, like Winston Churchill. If he go to war, he has general better than him, more qualified than Winston Churchill. Therefore, he won the war. He doesn't take junior. He doesn't take yes, sir, yes, sir, all the time. He take a people who's strong next to him and tell him, sir, Winston Churchill, we want to do this and then he will evaluate and take decision. Always you need surrounded <clears throat> by strong people and your level or better than you. Don't never take somebody who's lower than you. Then you'll be, you'll be sunk. Always you have to take and your level or better than you, you have to accept it. You have to accept, you know, if you, are, if you want to lead, a group or a company or a organization or association or establishment, always you have to choose people <clears throat> in your caliber or better than you. Never choose less than you. If you lose less than you and you want to show them you are better, you are a loser at the end of the day. But that's not easy. That's not easy to, to find strong, but thanks God, I have them. I have them with me in this office and in all my units. Strong people, I depend on them a lot, and without them, I will not be here. I depend on them, on their knowledge, and their loyalty, and their expertise in everything, you know. We don't differentiate in my group of religion. We don't, I don't differentiate, this is my belief, religion or color or culture or back any background i believe on somebody who can deliver who can deliver i give them all my trust and all my backing all 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 my you know support yes yeah so responsibility and discipline to make the decision then humility and i would say self confidence to be able to choose people that are better than you and not have to demonstrate you're better than them. That, that takes a lot of self-knowledge and being at peace with yourself yeah. because otherwise, 
as you said, you have to always demonstrate to other people you're better, and then you choose mediocre and then people. You lose. And then you lose, yes. <laughs> yes, but you can blame them for losing. Uh, that, that, that's, that's very clear. Now, how, how did you inspire these people? Because you say you are loyal to them and they are very loyal to you. How did you create that bond of trust with these great people that support you? Because that's the essence of leadership. How did you do that? Well, uh, it is easy, not very difficult sometimes, uh, provided that person can learn. And I have my conventional way of management. Tell us. It is not so sophisticated. And the way I manage, I try to convince these people to work the way I work. The way, you know, somebody come, for example, graduated from Georgetown or George Washington, and he come to me, let us say my son. And they would say, oh, the system here is not right, and this, we have to do it, you know, very advanced, sophisticated, and this, and we'll do that. I start to evaluate it. You know, he came, he graduated. I mean, all this is theoretical. If this professor in the university can replace me, then I will agree. But I know that professor in the university, he can teach you, he do a great job to feed you with information. I mean, and that is, everybody has specialized. And this professor who is teaching you, or the teacher, is doing a great job to fuel you, fueling. But in practical, I know better than him. In practicality, because everybody, you know, you are engineer, you are a doctor, you are et cetera, et cetera. You know, we need specialized people. And I am specialized in my area, more than the professor in the university, which is teaching, for example, uh, engineering or medicine or administration or finance. Therefore, I mean, I, I trained my own people. I trained them myself what is the practicality than the theoretical way of life. And then they are catching. Of course, sometimes we disagree on a lot of things. And I have a meeting every morning at 7.30 in my office. 7.30, we discuss with my top director and we agree on this or we decide not to agree. I mean, really, we are learning from each other. And, you know, you will find in the office different nationality. That is an education as well. I mean, if you go to anywhere in the world, for example, let us take an Arab country. If we take Saudi Arabia or Egypt, you know, you will find Saudi working in one company, Egyptian working. If you go to England, English working. I mean, here, you will have maybe 120 nationality in one office. You educate yourself from them. You learn from them. You, you learn from their culture, their, their experience, their way of approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I consider our company, as I say, it is a school, and everyone who leaves us, he got a good position, but not recognized like us here. We recognize everybody. This is the difference. And how do you create harmony between all these different groups of people? Because the, uh, it's, diversity is great, but there's a reason why most people have difficulty with it, because it's easier to work with people who are just like you. So you have managed to bring all these different nationalities, religions, races, genders, and make them work in harmony. How, how did you do that? What's the, what's the way? Anna, I believe in something which is transparency. The people I work with or work for, you know, work for them. I work for them. I said, you know, you are not working for me. I am working for you because I don't sleep, you sleep. <laughs> I have to create business to keep the company work, uh, continue. You know, um, that's me as Khalaf al-Habtur. That's me since I don't, when, I, uh, when I was a little boy, when I was riding camels, when I was with my father, when I go to Sheikh Rashid, when I go to Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh Khalifa. That is my nature, you know. And I am with my people, you know, 
the natural to say hello to everybody, T-boy and this, everybody. I say good morning, good morning to them. Without, I'm not forcing myself. That's my nature. But everybody should be disciplined. Everybody should deliver. This is what this, we, uh, 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 we recognize. People with the delivery. We don't, I don't care whether he is tall or short or white or Christian or Muslim or imam in the a mosque or uh, I don't care about that. I care that he is loyal to this company and he is delivering. The person who deliver, with, we don't, I don't care from he, where he comes, I will salute him. And he will be the recognized person among everybody. That is, that is my philosophy. And this I didn't study in the school. I didn't study it in a book or this. That is my own feeling, my own strategy, my own way of life and my own way of appreciation or assessment, let us call it. Yes. Well, um, the, the subtitle of my book was Building Value with Values. And when I was listening to you, I thought, you are choosing a dimension of values in terms of uniformity. So in terms of delivery, responsibility, there's no diversity. It's not like, well, if you want, you deliver. That everything else is flexible, is variable. Religion, nationality, color, whatever. But the values are the essence of the culture that you have created. And I, I find that very powerful because that will make business or your organization a place of peace. Because as long as people share the values and they deliver, they can work in harmony. And um, I, I, I find that spirit of tolerance, the culture of Dubai, being manifest in that idea of bringing everybody together based on shared values and delivery. We, we need to deliver, we need, there's a culture of performance. That's very true, that's very true. Um, so I, I, I love the way you said that, and I was impressed by what you said, they don't work for me, I work for them. So I, I think that that's very profound in terms that's of leadership. Can, can, but can you can you elaborate that? Uh, that it's not it's not normal that the top person in the company will say they don't work for me, I work for them. So I'd like to hear more about that. How how do you well, think? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, if you look at it in practically in practical life and practical, and you can feel it, I work for them rather than they are working for me. I mean. I think, I plan, I put things in, in, in the line, etc. But sometimes, you know, I let them execute it. I let them do it. I, you know, of course, I am with them. Teamwork, we execute it. But the, the difference between me and them, I worry how we finish this job. If we didn't finish this job, where are this family and this people going? I have to create another job for them. You know, I let them where. I don't sleep very well. They sleep, they go home, because they are, they know that Khalaf al-Habtur is a captain of the ship and he's taking care of them. I mean, they are, most of them, they believe in me, which is good. And I believe in them. I believe in them a lot. But I am, I appointed myself. I, I designate myself as, you know, a person to serve them a person to work for them, to create jobs for them, a continuation for them and their families. You know, you're not employing one person, you're employing a family. This person feed family, taking care of family, educate family, etc. And this is the different, the philosophy, you know, if I am different of somebody who doesn't care, he has, because there is a different between rich and wealthy. There's a big difference. Right? Say more about that. How do you think of I that? I will tell you the secret. For, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know. Always I said, you know, success and rich and, and a wealthy man. A wealthy man who inherited. Inherited a lot of money, a lot of buildings, etc. He go in a cafe and sit have his coffee in the morning in a cafe, in Starbucks or whatever, and uh, 
you know, he take the rent every day and he doesn't care about the employees. He take, uh, he's not going to create job for them. If there's no tenant, he fire them and get rid of them. But a person who are called a rich, not only rich in money, richness on thinking, richness and worrying and caring. This is what I call it rich. And caring, worrying, thinking, how can I create? How can I continue creating jobs? I want in a state of 20,000, 30,000 people, men and women working for me, or I'm working, taking care of them. I need more, to, to worry more. This is my principle, which is very bad, worrying. To worry. I mean, this is, you know, if you are responsible about a lot of families, you have no alternative except to worry all the time, right? The, uh, the wealthy, he doesn't worry because he gets the money every month. You know, he's not uh, planning uh, to, uh, for example, in hotels, what is the occupancy, what is the rate, there is more rooms, this, I don't want to lose my employees, I don't want to get rid of them, I don't want to close a restaurant, I don't want to, go. you know, you have to create. You have to, th to worry about them. I mean, I, always a person, in my opinion, who worried, I think it is one step or two steps to success. A person who is careless, you know, they, they don't think, they said, doesn't matter, we'll see tomorrow what's happening and this, or after tomorrow or next week. And on the weekend, when it comes the weekend, I hate it. I hate the weekend. I mean, weekend to me, two days, uh, but all my management, the top management, always we are in contact. I'm not telling them to do that themselves. They come, their house is next to the office here, all these villas for them. They walk to the offices, they meet and discuss, you know, because we have time different, for example, between us and the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And we have business with America. And, you know, sometime at night, the night team, and the group, you know, they have to have a telephone conversation or what you call the screen. Huh? Uh, yeah. And, you know, they do it and, uh, you know, they communicate uh, because they are responsible. Not because the money, because they are loyal. They are part of the success. Well, in a way, worry is the other side of care. If you care, you worry. Yeah. And you only worry about things you care. So your, your worry is an expression of, of care. Worry about creating things, worry about a failure, worry about rumors, worry about, uh, you know, things you have to fix everything, to worry about things and fix it and get rid of it. <laughs> but that's a continuation. You cannot stop the worry. You spoke about the, the care for creating jobs and helping the people in your company, but you're also well known for caring about people in the community, for doing, as you said, uh, work in education and contributing to other areas. What, what's your philosophy about the opportunity that a business leader has to go beyond the company and contribute to society? Unfortunately, in the Arab world, a Muslim world, we are not taking the steps of the West, and in particular, United States of America, where people donate 80% of their wealth to charity. And I will tell you a story that happened to me in New York. And we Muslim in the, in the, Arab, in the world, which was around 1.7, 1.8, let us take 10%, they have money. If we put zakah, which is 2.5% from your profit or revenue, whatever. No poor will be in the Muslim countries. Not only in the Arab, in the world. And I invited, I was studying very important uh, subject, which is uh, poverty alleviation. And uh, I asked some of the university to put 
some ideas and we did it ourselves in our new office. We did our study as well. And uh, we put some plan and I wrote a letter to very important people in the world to invite them for round table discussion. Because I myself, I cannot do it. And two, three people, they cannot do it. But we need a lot of people, an idea. We don't want the money now. We need the idea, everyone to throw an idea and then we can compile that idea and we'll try to implement it wherever they will choose the place. And that idea, I said, we can plan and start. Always we have to start from again. To start, to help. I mean, if we implement, I mean, for example, on the Torah, the Jewish, they pay 10%. I asked one of my greatest friends, he's Israeli Jewish, and he said, in the, we have 10% we have to pay, like zakah for the Muslim, 2.5%. I said, are you sure you are paying 10%? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christian, definitely on, on the Bible, there is something to help the people, and there is a percentage, but a lot of Christian, they will not admit that. Muslim, a lot of people, this is the Quran, I mean, and they are hiding from it, unfortunately. If we insist on that, and this is by law, and this is constitution of God in all the three religions, okay, that you must do that. There will be no poor or sick or, you know, a, a, a child abuse in the world. Nobody. You know, if we can, implement. of course, I was telling to my friend Jeff yesterday, you can, I cannot go and chase every businessman in the world, but government should, from the tax they are taking from the people all over the world, they have to give us two and a half percent to this organization. Organization to be chosen under an umbrella of will covered, well-respected people. Forget about the United Nations. Forget about Arab League. Forget about all this. I don't trust them. No, I need respectable people. I mean, like Warren Buffett, like a lot of people in the world, you know, not only in America, but the American, they, they did better than us. Better than they implement charity more than us, the Muslim, which is stamped on the Quran, you have to pay. We are not doing that. There is a lot of, you know, opportunities that we approach people to help. And there is a lot of good people in the world. Yeah. Well, but we cannot, you know, go and whip them. We have to persuade them. We have to persuade them. We have to meet. I call for the meeting, unfortunately, the wrong timing. Otherwise, I would love them to come here, explain them. I'm ready to go to them wherever they are, sit with them. I'm ready to, the first person, to agree and give them my idea and to give them the donation as well to help, you know. But we need somebody to help. And I think the only person can help in that strong person should be from United States of America more than here. Because they look at us, we are small people, you know. And we agree, I agree. I am not uh, insulted by that. I agree. <clears throat> if one of this organization called, I'm ready to fly today, not tomorrow, to attend that because that's very important. So before I open this to the public and some other questions they might have, I'd like to hear what <coughs> inspires you. What, what, when you look at your, your mission, your legacy, as a, as a human being, as the leader, the captain of a, of a company uh, and, and, a, and a group like yours, what, what is it that you aspire to, to leave for the world? I believe on something uh, God gave me. God gave me with hard work. God will not give you while you are sleeping. You have to work hard and open for me the door. I have to give back. I have to give back. When God gives you something, you have to give back where it is necessary. This is what I believe in it, without going farther 
to be a fellow sufar, you know. I mean, I believe in some, when God gives you something for a reason, God will give you something for a reason that also you have to help. Not choose and you are not a messenger of God or you are not an angel coming. You are a human being and God gave you this. Therefore, he also, God gave you this also to know, to help and to assist the, within your limitation. Everybody within the limitation. I mean, you cannot, uh, I mean, I, I cannot give what Warren Buffett is giving. I cannot give what uh, King Salman or Sheikh Khalifa. But all of us, we have to join. The king, the president, the sheikh, this, together with the big guys from all over the world. We have rich people in Asia, in the Arab world, in India, in Pakistan, all this. And to get together, but we need to gather them. To gather them, I'm trying. And I will try, I will not give up. Trust me, I will not give up. I will even ready to fly to them and knock their door. I know maybe they will kick me out. One, two times, then they'll let me in. <laughs> what would you tell them when they let you in? What are you going to say to them? Well, I, 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 will, I think these people is knowledgeable people. They are people who cares. I don't need to explain them a lot. Uh, the only thing I will tell them, let us, uh, enough talks, enough talks, and enough press conferences. Let us put hand together. Let us, we believe in you guys, and you are more experienced than us. You worked already on these areas, and, uh, you know, I'm ready to bring few guys to cooperate, and we start immediately. We choose some places to help. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Khalaf. You've been thank very you. kind thank with you, your time. Thank you. Thank you.